Great. Hi, welcome. Um, as people are coming in from the waiting room, we're just going to give it a minute or two. So come on in and get ready for a talk about repatriation. Okay, so we might have a couple of other people join us, but I'm going to go ahead and get this started. Um, my name is Shana Dumont-Gar, and I'm the curator at Fruitlands Museum in Harvard, Massachusetts, which is a property of the trustees. And I'm really pleased to welcome Shannon Martin as a speaker today. And before I do that, I want to acknowledge that Fruitlands Museum is on the ancient homeland and traditional territory of the Nipmuc and Pawtucket tribal nations, closely related to nearby Massachusetts and Wampanoag tribal nations. We acknowledge the history of settler colonialism and the repeated violations of sovereignty and territory perpetuated by European settlers. And um, as one of the staff members at Fruitlands Museum, I speak on behalf of the museum as we say that we began a process to change how we present indigenous culture at the museum in 2019, because we want to not only display the collection of over 2,500 objects, and by the way, that is the largest proportion of objects that we have in our permanent collection, we want to change how we share that collection in a way that centers the priorities of those that this collection represents. But more importantly, we also want to celebrate the continuance of Indigenous peoples. And that is part of what brings us here today. Um, this comic book, Journeys to Complete the Work, um, it explains the Native American graves and Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, most commonly known, especially among museum professionals as NAGPRA, in an approachable way. As one of 15 contemporary art publications on view in the exhibition Recruiting for Utopia, Print and the Imagination, which was co-curated um, by Paige Johnston and me, um, this is an example of how artists and scholars team up to shift opinions from confrontation into cooperation. Um, and this book or, or comic to be really specific, this comic is available at cost at the museum gift shop at Fruitlands Museum. And um, when you registered, there was kind of a confirmation that provided you a link. Um, it gets also on our web um, shop. And so now I'm going to introduce Shannon. Um, Shannon, Martin, Ojibwe and Potawatomi, sorry about my pronunciation. <laughs> hey, Shannon, um, is the director of the Zeebwing Center of Anishinaabe Culture and Lifeways in Michigan. Her experience working to repatriate remains of tribal ancestors and cultural materials from the University of Michigan and Harvard is featured in this comic. She's one of its stars. Um, and we invited her to speak about her contribution to the book as a co-author and as a subject within the comic, um, and also about her work more broadly. So, um, Shannon, I think I'll um, kind of give you the focus and um, welcome you so much. Thank you very much for being here today. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and turn off my video and then return for the Q&A section. And for those of you who are joining, if you have questions, please feel free to submit them to the Q&A section. Um, and then we'll have Catherine Shortliff return with me um, to kind of have a little bit of a conversation with Shannon. So thank you so much again, Shannon. And I'm going to say goodbye for now. All right, be quick. Well, Buju, Nindaway Namani Duk, greetings, my relatives. Anungo Kwayandeshnikas, I am known as Star Woman. Bijou and Dodem, I am from the Lynx clan. 
Ibenishi wish Botawatomi, Menwa, Lakuta Ray, Lake Superior, Ojibwe, Nishnabe, Kwe, and Dao. I'm enrolled, I'm an enrolled citizen with the Machi Benishiwish Band of Potawatomi Indians or the Gun Lake Tribe of Southwest Michigan. And I'm a descendant of the Lakuta Ray Band of Lake Superior Chippewa Indians in Wisconsin. Waba Zibing in Donjaba, Minwa Saginaw Ojibwe in Anishinaabe, a king in Donjaba. I come from the land that gave me life called the Rabbit River area of Southwest Michigan and Potawatomi country, a little settlement called the Salem Indian Settlement. But I also breathe and give my life here to the Saginaw Chippewa tribe of Michigan. And that's where I'm uh, coming to you from, from the Isabella Indian Reservation in Saginaw Chippewa Territory near Mount Pleasant, Michigan. And I just have to say, I'm, I'm so grateful to be a part of this conversation today. Uh, I'm so uh, honored that the Fruitland Museum invited me to, to talk with you all this afternoon a little bit about NAGPRA and what that means for us as contemporary Native American people. And just wanna give a shout out to all the other practitioners and the institutions and museums that are working uh, at this very minute, I'm sure, on consultation and working on the return for the re 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 responsible and respectful uh, ancestral cultural patrimony items and sacred objects that are held in these places back to the tribes of origin. And today is the 30th birthday for NAGPRA. On this day, 30 years ago, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act uh, began its work. So in 1990, that happened. And after 30 years, um, it's, it's unfortunate to say that there are still well over 180,000 sets of Native American ancestors or individuals that are still held within museums, institutions, and federal repositories across this country. I have to um, acknowledge all of those uh, brave aunties and uncles, I call them, uh, the mothers and fathers of this great law that took place in 1990. Folks like Suzanne Schoen Harjo, uh, Senator Daniel Inouye, Senator Ben Nighthorse Campbell, uh, Senator John McCain, uh, Vernon Bellacourt, Dennis Banks, all these individuals worked tirelessly during the 1980s and into 1990 to finally see this law uh, come to fruition. And this law that was set into course is, it's, was meant to be a balanced law, a law that um, provided recourse for American Indian tribes to consult and to free and to bring home their ancestors and their belongings from the various museums and institutions across this country. The other side of the Balance Act was for science and for research and for museums and institutions to, um, to share what they call a, a, a history that is ingrained in, in the United States of America and to present that and exhibit it. Um, so the law, was meant to be balanced, uh, but in many ways, uh, the balancing uh, tipped more into the favor of the museums and institutions, the researchers and the scientists. For American Indian people, it is often a rigorous and very difficult uh, time to bring our ancestors home. It's, it's work that um, is, is a burden on many of us financially, uh, mm -hmm emotionally and spiritually uh, to, to engage in this type of, of responsibility. Because our ancestors, they didn't have a voice. They didn't have a choice uh, when they were unearthed or excavated, whether that was intentionally or unintentionally. They didn't have a choice or a voice to say, stop, please leave my remains in the ground, leave my body in the ground with the thing I was lovingly buried with by my relatives of that time. And 
us as descendants of the ancestors who were brought up from the earth and placed into the various museums and institutions to be studied, to be handled. Uh, it is, it's our calling to do this work and a responsibility, unfortunately, that we never thought we would have to do. Just to complete the work uh, was a vision of Dr. Sonia Adelai, who I call my sister. We've adopted each other as sisters as such. Uh, she calls my, my mom and dad her parents. She calls my siblings her siblings. But Sonia and I went to uh, undergraduate school together at the University of Michigan. And there we learned uh, about the atrocities that had taken place against our ancestral people. There we learned the numbers of our ancestors that were held at the University of Michigan. And there we also learned that the University of Michigan was not taking a proactive stance or position to return our ancestors back to our people. And that was in you know, the mid, the early 90s and into the mid 90s that um, we began to question our university. And as students, Native American Student Association, uh, we asked for meetings with heads of the anthropology department. We asked for meetings with the Dean of Students and with the provost office, questioning the university why uh, we're not seeing any of our ancestors being returned to their tribal and fa familial communities. And for the most part, we were told, you don't have much power here. This is, NAGPRA is a law that binds us to tribes, not students. But um, as students, we kept knocking on doors, we kept reminding them that they had a, a lawful responsibility to be compliant when it came to the NAGPRA law, that they had to consult with tribes and consultation meant more than just sending the tribal chief a letter or the tribal chairman a letter saying this is what we have in our collection. True and meaningful consultation had to take place in the forms of the university calling tribal offices and, and asking them, can you please come to the University of Michigan? We would like to meet with you. We would like to begin a process to return your ancestors to you. Those types of calls never went out from the University of Michigan. That type of relationship building at that time never happened. And that was the story from about the University of Michigan, even into 2001, 2002, 2003, uh, even into 2004, uh, there was still no movement to work with tribal communities on the return of their ancestral remains and their belongings. So at that time, I, I graduated from the University of Michigan in the mid nineties. Sonia graduated, went on to graduate school and, and to pursue her PhD. We never forgot about our ancestors at our alma mater. I went on to take a position with the Saginaw Chippewa Indian tribe of Michigan. And I'm happy to say that uh, I celebrated 19 years working for the Zeboing Cultural Society and the Zeboing Center here at the Saginaw Chippewa Indian Tribe of Michigan on Friday. Friday was my anniversary day. Uh, but I, we never forgot about them. And, and as soon as you know, I, I started working here at the tribe, my founding director, Bonnie Ecto, who had started repatriation work for this tribe back in 1993, 94, um, pulled our little team together and she said, we need to begin the work of repatriation again. Uh, our focus had been on developing and building the Zeebwing Center of Anishinaabe Culture and Lifeways, which is a beautiful facility, you know, almost 35,000 square feet, uh, has a permanent exhibition, changing exhibition gallery, meeting rooms, tribal collection storage, um, our focus was on that for about four years. And then she called us together in about 2005. And she says, uh, we need to focus on our ancestors. We need to get back to that, that responsible work to get them home. So Bonnie wrote a grant 
uh, application to the uh, National NAGPRA program, which gives grant funds competitively to tribes and museums and institutions to begin the work of consultation. So the grant was submitted in 2004 and it was awarded in 2005. So that meant we were able to legally, with our own funding, compel the University of Michigan to meet with us about our ancestors. So in 2005 and 2006 and into 2007, a responsibility of the University of Michigan is to open their doors to us and to open their file cabinets and, and share um, information on three sites that we had cited uh, that we would like to repatriate. And the Saginaw Chippewa Indian Tribe of Michigan gained permission from the other tribes in Michigan to pursue the repatriation of three sites within Michigan that held uh, approximately uh, more than half of the collection that, that constituted more than half of the collection at the University of Michigan. So well over 700 ancestral human remains. And those sites were the Rivera Young site, which is just north of Detroit, kind of along the, the St. Clair. Uh, the other site was the Bussinger site, the Businger site, and then the Young site, which is in the Thumb area of Michigan. And these three sites are well within the Saginaw Chippewa Aboriginal territory. So we hired um, Dr. Sonia Adelaide, uh, my sister friend, as a consultant, archaeological consultant on our behalf. And we spent two years rigor rigorously putting together our uh, claim for these ancestors. And that included citing historical documents, uh, oral history, um, providing um, everything from newspaper articles, historical articles, to prove that uh, these ancestors were our ancestors. They were related to the Saginaw Chippewa Indian Tribe of Michigan as a contemporary Native American tribe. During the course of that two years of the consultation grant, the University of Michigan agreed to one meeting with us, just one meeting, in-person meeting on, at the campus. Dr. John O'Shea, who's in charge of the Great Lakes Collection, uh, was also in charge of all repatriation efforts at the University of Michigan. Uh, at some institutions, they call them a NAGPRA compliance officer or a NAGPRA officer. I'm not sure what his exact title was, but he was in charge of our ancestors. He set up one meeting with us where he and his team pulled from the shelves and from the, from the boxes funerary objects, funerary belongings that they wanted us to see and view. We were not allowed to go through the inventory and ask them to pull which items we needed to see that would give us direct proof and correlation to the continuity of our funerary rites. They pulled items for our eyes that they wanted us to see only. So during this one hour of them allowing us spending time with our ancestors' funerary belongings, they were taking rigorous notes uh, about what we were saying, just you know, fervently scratching down and what they were overhearing us talking about. Our tribal elders were present, uh, respected spiritual leaders were present, and we were trying to engage with ourselves and with our ancestors' funerary belongings, but we were being watched and recorded the entire time. After that hour, we asked, can we go visit the ancestors? We want to see the place where they're, they're stored. We want to make sure that, you know, they're not stored in some leaky basement or some place where um, they could be compromised, you know, stolen again. So they drove us to another site and our ancestors were stored in, in the back of the campus uh, police department's uh, facility. And so they were, our ancestors were separated from the funerary belongings that they were buried with. The prized, what they consider the prized funerary belongings were held uh, at the Museum of Anthropology on central campus, 
but our ancestral remains, their bones, were in boxes on shelves at the campus police department. So as we went to visit them, uh, you know, our hearts were heavy knowing, you know, the condition and the care uh, that they were in, that those beautiful things that their family gave them when they passed away in their time were not even with them. They were separated from those things. And when we went into the facility at the campus police department where they were being held, we asked, can we sing them a song? Can we leave them a tobacco offering? Can we offer a prayer? And Dr. John O'Shea told us, no, you cannot do that because they may not be affiliated to you. So therefore you cannot sing to them. You cannot offer a prayer. You cannot uh, offer a tobacco bundle for them. So we said, fine, we'll go outside and do it. They'll still hear us. We'll go outside. So, and that's what we did. We went outside and right in front of the campus police department, we stood in a circle, we had a ceremony, we smoked the pipe, we offered our prayers and we sang a song for them, knowing that they would hear us. They, they know we're here. Even though we couldn't be in the same room with them, they knew we were gonna fight for them to get back home. So that was what was called their version of consultation. And we submitted our letter and our request for the claim of these ancestors from the three sites. And within three months, we received a one and a half page letter back from the Associate Vice Provost for Research stating, we cannot repatriate these ancestors to you because we believe that they are not affiliated to you. And in that letter, it gave no determinations, no evidence of why the University of Michigan did not believe they could be affiliated to the Saginaw Chippewa Indian Tribe of Michigan. We were not given any site files, any excavation reports, anything related to them was not shared with us during that two years. We had to find all that information out for ourselves. And we presented a very good case, but we were denied our ancestors. So in March of 2008, we, uh, along with other tribal representatives from throughout Michigan, spiritual leaders, students from both University of Michigan and Eastern Michigan University, faculty and staff allies from the University of Michigan, we descended upon the, the Regents building where the, the University of Michigan administration is housed. And we had asked earlier uh, to be placed on the Board of Regents public commentary session. So we were on the session, we were given five minutes to read a statement and that statement could not, there were no questions asked, we couldn't answer anything, we just had to go in and read a statement. And the Saginaw Chippewa's Public Relations Department uh, Director, Mr. Joseph Samick, read a statement on behalf of the Saginaw Chippewa Indian Tribe of Michigan to the Board of Regents. Before that statement was read, though, I have to go back. As we gathered in front of the Fleming Administration Building at the University of Michigan, you know, there was probably about a hundred of us there. You know, we offered a song, there was a drum group. They sang, we, we offered a, our collective prayers. And one of our spiritual leaders said in that prayer, let's just ask that our statement and our presence here reach the heart and spirit of at least one of these regents. We just need to reach one to begin questioning the University of Michigan's practices when it came to NAGPRA. So that happened. We went in knowing that this was our chance to reach at least one. And once we came out of the Fleming building, we sort of breathed a sigh of relief because those of us who were in the room with the regents could see that we were reaching more than one of them when they were hearing our statement being read. So fast forward about two months later, the University of Michigan under the uh, provost and, and vice provost office, 
uh, issued a statement that they were going to form a multidisciplinary committee to investigate the University of Michigan's noncompliance when it came to NAGPRA. So we had reached one or two regents and we were, we were happy for that because we went in there respectfully, we read our statement and the university began to shift. And from that um, committee, it turned into a formalized committee called the University of Michigan's Committee on Culturally Identifiable Human Remains. And on that committee, there is a seat that's open for Michigan, a Michigan uh, tribal representative. And my brother, uh, William Johnson, who is the curator at, at Zeboing, he works with me. He's also the chair of the Michigan Anishinaabe Cultural Preservation and Repatriation Alliance. He's the chair of that MACPRA Alliance, sits on that committee and he's been our tribal representative working with the University of Michigan for the past, uh, I would say 10 years. The committee has been formalized for, for 10 years now. But MACPRA uh, is a formidable alliance here in Michigan. Uh, there are representatives from all 12 federally recognized tribes here in Michigan and the two state historic tribes. So there are 14 representatives with 14 alternates that serve on this alliance. And this alliance effectuates NAGPRA for the state of Michigan. In 2011, NAGPRA initiated 18 letters requesting disposition from universities and institutions throughout this country. And to this day, uh, NAGPRA has completed the, the work to bring home our ancestors and their funerary belongings from 15 of those institutions and museums. So we're still working with a few more. Uh, University of Michigan, we're about halfway completed with repatriating our ancestors that were pulled from the state of Michigan's land. And then we're still working with Michigan State University. We're working with Indiana University and then we're also, let's see, that's it. So we've got about three universities that we're still working with. From that point forward, we'll start working in the, at the Smithsonian Institution with their affiliates. There are ancestors uh, through the Smithsonian affiliates and that's a whole other law that we have to work through. But the work of bringing our ancestors home uh, it's, it's, it's difficult because it is a law and you have to follow the law and the consultation process can take a long time. Um, and especially in the time of COVID, uh, we're, we're seemingly slower at, at the work that we need to do. Uh, but we're, we're doing the work through virtual conferencing and consultation and that's moving things along with Michigan State University. So within the next few weeks, we'll be bringing home ancestors from Michigan State University and getting them back into the earth. The Saginaw Chippewa Indian Tribe of Michigan has a cemetery solely dedicated to the repatriated ancestral human remains of, of our people. And it's called the Nibokan Cemetery, uh, those that came before a cemetery. And um, that's where we bring them home. And it's on federal Indian trust land. So it's, it's a place that will never be disturbed again and always be under the, the watchful eye of the tribe. Um, but the work, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a responsibility that many of us who are doing it from the tribal perspective believe that the ancestors chose you to do it. It's, it's work that you, you wouldn't, most people won't, wouldn't choose to do this work. You're drawn to it. Uh, the ancestors identify those who are able to carry out this work. And um, I have to say that my parents, um, both of them are, are firmly um, supportive and have always been doing this work uh, since the 1970s, even before the NACPRA law. My, both my parents and my grandmother on my mother's side were, were taking care of our ancestors. 
seek because we lived in a, a small farming community in Southwest Michigan. We were just a one of a very uh, few handfuls of, of tribal families that were sprinkled throughout, you know, the Grand Rapids, Kalamazoo, Holland area. And most people knew where the Indians lived. There was the Salem Indian settlement and the Bradley Indian settlement. And my grandmother Gladys sold black ash baskets. So many people throughout the region knew who she was. And uh, she was a Potawa old, old Potawatomi grandma and um, people would stop and visit her to buy her baskets. But um, growing up, I do remember going to uh, help with ancestors when I was about seven years old. Uh, somebody pulled into my grandmother's driveway one day to buy baskets, but then they said, you know, our neighbor was um, doing some tilling over in his south, his south um, property, and he came upon a tree that had uh, blown over. And um, he was asking us who he needs to contact. And um, so my grandma said, well, what, what's the problem? And they said, well, that we, he thinks there's a skeleton in the tree roots. And he thinks it's Native American because there were some, there was some objects, some funerary belongings next to the tree. So my grandmother got a hold of my, um, my folks and we, we um, drove over to this farmer's property and said, we can help you um, with that tree that fell over. And he took us out there and I was about seven years old and we walked the field and came to this uh, uprooted tree. And sure enough, there was a burial bundle there, an ancestor uh, who, was, who was entangled in, in the roots. And uh, we took care of that ancestor and we asked the farmer, do you want us to, to rebury or remove the ancestor? We can bury them on our property. And he's like, no, that's okay. Probably wants to be close to where, where um, he was buried. So we moved that ancestor just off into the wood line of that farmer's property. And he assured us, he goes, he goes, this property has been in my family for, you know, 100, 120 years. He goes, it's going to stay in the family. Don't worry. He goes, nothing will happen to that ancestor. So we had a ceremony and, and we were able to bury that ancestor close to where their original burial was. And we were, you know, we were certain that they wouldn't be disturbed again. But that was, you know, my earliest memory, childhood memory of, of doing this important work, this respectful work for our ancestors. And it has just, you know, compounded over the years, when you think about um, urban sprawl, when you think about new construction projects, um, pipelines and pipeline replacements happening, uh, the occurrence of, you know, the inadvertent discovery of our ancestors is going to continue to happen. And um, we just have to be vigilant. And when ancestors are unearthed on private property or state lands, uh, they're not held under the NAGPRA uh, law. So tribes have to be aware of what's going on and work with tribal, you know, work as tribes with private citizens and with the state of Michigan when this happens. But um, again, the, this law is, is it's important. Um, it's a law that has some flaws. It's not fully balanced. Uh, but it is one that finally gave us recourse to bring our ancestors home and to protect our, our sacred and burial sites throughout this country. And those protections are so needed, you know, because we still hear about looting that's happening and grave robbing that's happening across this country. Just um, less than three years ago, there was a collector down in Ohio uh, who was investigated by the Federal Bureau of in Investigations. Uh, our tribe uh, was called on to consult. So Willie Johnson consulted on that, that case. But this man was still going and digging up graves in North and South Dakota as early as the 2000s. Um, he was digging up um, contemporary and historic graves of Lakota and Dakota people and bringing them back to his home. Um, 
what they found in his home was just, it was a shop of horrors from what I understand. You know, there were bodies in, in his home on display in cases that still had flesh and hair on them. Um, so you can, you know, if you want to read more information, and you know, about looters, that was probably one of the, the worst recent cases of looting uh, that is that has happened in this country, but it's still happening. The Southwest is always um, being looted. Sacred sites and archaeological sites are being looted in the night. So this law really... Um, it's an important, it's an important human rights law, uh, but it really is one without teeth. Uh, so for those who universities and institutions who are non-compliant when it comes to con consulting with tribes, there's no really no penalties uh, for institutions and museums to be reluctant and resistant uh, to uh, working with tribes on the repatriation of their ancestors. So this comic book, um, when we developed this comic book, we wanted to develop in a, in a way that would speak not only to tribal youth and our, our, uh, our scholars, our young scholars who are wanting to learn more about this work, but we wanted it to be an informational for those who had no idea um, about NAGPRA or no idea that our ancestors had been looted and collected and stolen for many generations and that they were placed in museums and institutions across this country. So it really is a, an awareness piece um, that um, we wanted to provide and just give in, in what we could the layman's terms about the law, the important points of it by focusing on two case studies. One was the University of Michigan and one was Harvard. So I, at this time, I'd like to um, share uh, a PowerPoint that we developed for our tribal community, but it's one that we've shared with other tribal communities when they're um, providing an, uh, public relations and awareness to their own constituents about the work of NAGPRA. And it's an ongoing education and awareness that we have to do because even some within our own communities don't know. So this um, particular PowerPoint was developed and it was shown at an annual State of the Tribe address here at the Saginaw Chippewa. And we wanted to provide the Saginaw Chippewa citizens an update as to our progress and, and what we were doing uh, to protect and to uh, give the dignity back to our ancestors. So if you just pause with me, I'm going to share my screen. So a delegation of us left Mount Pleasant and we drove straight to Andover on October 7th. And we uh, retrieved the one ancestor from the Peabody and we drove straight to 
the University of Michigan. This is our delegation. We brought our tribal elder Ruby Mishabus with us. She's in the uh, the fashionable zebra skin outfit there. William Johnson, my my brother and curator at Zebuing, is in the blue shirt, standing on the right side. And these are this is the staff from the uh, Peabody over in Andover. From there, we went to the University of Michigan on our way home and we met other tribal representatives and we retrieved 124 of our ancestors and their 219 associated funerary objects from the University of Michigan. Transfer possession uh, document, making it a legal binding document where the University of Michigan is, is transferring the ancestors and, and belongings to us took place in a ceremonial signing at the Kipke Campus Safety Building. That's the campus police department. The unfortunate, um, the unfortunate, uh, I can't even think of the word, um, desecration that happened to our ancestors is that 125 of them were so splintered and degraded that they were kept in 9,360 boxes, uh, which contained over 100, as you can see, 103,801 individual fragments. So these ancestors were not, of course, fully intact. They had been disintegrated to, to bone fragments. So we took all of our ancestors, the one from Andover and 125 from the University of Michigan back to the Zeebwing Center, where we had volunteers, community volunteers, uh, other tribal representatives from Michigan and Montana join us to complete the work to get them rebundled for their recommitment to the earth ceremony. The last day of getting them rebundled, Mount Pleasant and Shepherd Public High Schools right here near town released their 11th and 12th grade Anishinaabe students for the day to assist and witness with the repatriation work. A newly formed Saginaw Chippewa Men's Society also assisted with the reburial. Here's an image of them. Uh, in the middle of the picture is the late Dennis Banks, one of the co-founders of the American Indian Movement and also one of the early authors and contributors to the NAGPRA law. Once we got the ancestors ceremonied and bundled and ready, uh, we walked them from two, two miles from the Zeebwing Center to the Nibakan Cemetery for their recommitment to the earth ceremony. And we call it recommitment to the earth. We don't call it reburial uh, because in their time, these ancestors were buried in a sacred place. They were in their own little cemetery or burial grounds. They had been given their funerary rites and ceremonies. So we didn't have to do that again for them. So we have uh, termed this a recommitment ceremony. And this is the um, delegation lovingly carrying the ancestors. They're all bundled in, in, in cedar and smudged and they've got feast food with them. And they're being carried to the uh, ancestral cemetery. So the tribal community, we have Volunteers, we count on every single time we do a repatriation. They're a part of this work. This is the Nibokan Cemetery on the Isabella Indian Reservation, Saginaw Chippewa Territory.
This is Dennis Banks preparing the uh, Men's Society to get ready for what they needed to do to carry our ancestors. So this effort was, in, was accomplished with the 12 federally recognized tribes and two state historic tribes in Michigan, along with the Chippewa Cree tribe of the Rocky Boys Reservation of Montana and the Sakagan Chippewa community of Wisconsin. They're taking the ancestors into a uh, lodge that we built for them. And that's where they'll have the, we'll do the last songs and prayers for the recommitment ceremony. So that was a uh, piece that we worked with our tribe's public relations department to share to inform our tribal community, our citizens. And uh, that actual PowerPoint has been shared with other tribes. So as a model or template that they can use to provide updates to their tribal councils and to their citizens as well. Uh, but it's important that um, we, we share this work and we share how to do this work with each other as tribal people because when some run into reluctant universities and institutions uh, like the University of Michigan was uh, and like Harvard, uh, Harvard's Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology still is, um, we need to, to share, share our knowledge and share whatever resources and templates we can to make this work easier for tribal people. The second part of uh, the um, comic book, the second story, the second case study is about Harvard uh, University's Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology. And that particular institution uh, is in the top 13 institutions in the country that has the highest number of ancestral remains still within their collections. Uh, we were as an alliance of tribes, we were fortunate enough to, to win another NAGPRA consultation and documentation award, a grant from the National NAGPRA program to engage in consultation with Peabody, with the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology. And that was two years of consultation with them. In the two years, we were able to uh, provide our claim and uh, ask for the disposition of culturally identifiable human remains or ancestors that came from the state of Michigan. And there were 98 uh, that were pulled from the university or pulled from Michigan that were now held at the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology. We provided our, our claim after two years of consultation and our claim was made from a, a new component of the NACPRA law <clears throat> that was promulgated in May of 2000, no, March of 2010. And that was called um, the 10.11 rule. 
And the 10.11 rule of the NAGPRA law pretty much stated that if you can claim these ancestors came from your Aboriginal territory, you can claim them as culturally identifiable, which means uh, we couldn't repatriate them as the Saginaw Chippewa Indian tribe of Michigan. Uh, otherwise, we would have to make a direct uh, and provide an evidence to the direct ancestry to them. But as an alliance of tribes, we decided to, to um, engage in the 10.11 rule to say that these are our ancestors. Uh, they could be Saginaw Chippewa, they could be Potawatomi, they could be Ottawa, but as an alliance of tribes, modern day contemporary tribal people, these ancestors were pulled from our, our collective uh, territory, what is now known as Michigan. And we um, provided that claim, but under that rule, it's not mandatory under the 10.11 rule of NAGPRA that an institution uh, has to give back the associated funerary objects or the, the, the burial belongings of the ancestors. And we, you know, we, we begged the University of Harvard, we begged the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology to let the ancestors go with their funerary belongings. Uh, elders cried. Uh, to, to the staff at the Peabody Museum. And they stated, you know, you can't, why would you want to keep their belongings and not let them have those things when they're recommitted to the earth? Our elders sat there in, in a conference room at the museum and cried. And um, when it was said and done, the Peabody had to, they, in the spirit of the law, they could have given those funerary belongings back when the ancestors were retrieved, but they decided to keep them. They kept their funerary belongings. And um, for us as, as tribal people, we tried to rectify that and in ways that we could under the law, but there was just nothing that we could do. Uh, it wasn't mandatory under the law that the funerary belongings be released with the ancestors. So our, our tribal elders and our spiritual people, um, we talked and they said, well, if they're gonna keep these belongings, then we, we can understand that our ancestors, they'll, they'll forgive us that we weren't able to get their belongings for them. And the spirit of those belongings that they were buried in, you know, decades, centuries ago, are with them now. So as we make our way home, call out to the community and ask them to make new burial belongings that we can send them with gifts as appeasement to let them know we love and cherish them. And we're sorry we couldn't bring their burial belongings home with them, but we've made you some other things. So we called back to the Saginaw Chippewa community and other tribal communities and within 24 hours, all 98 of those ancestors had a new gift that was handmade for them by our tribal community. So they were able to be buried with something. And even though we had to leave their original burial belongings back at the Peabody Museum because they refused to give them back to us, we were able to give them new things. And that's part of that case study that you see in, NAG, in NACPRA Comics 1 uh, with Harvard's uh, Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology. But Harvard is one of the, the top 13, you know, bad players when it comes to NACPRA. They're in the top 13 of being reluctant, of being resistant, and they use the NACPRA law in the words of you know, one of my sisters who does this work, Shannon Keller O'Loughlin, they use it as a ceiling rather than a floor and a foundation. Um, they interpret it the way they want to, and um, they use it to wield their own power over our people. So these are, you know, some of the struggles that we face when we work through the NAGPRA law. But I wanna go back to talk about some celebratory work 
you know, from a reluctant and resistant institution like the University of Michigan. Um, the Michigan tribes are now in a love affair with the University of Michigan. They have shifted so far uh, to the other side that um, NAGPRA, uh, NAGPRA Comics is going to be doing a part two on this story. And we're gonna be sharing the amazing work that the tribes and the University of Michigan are doing as far as uh, building partnerships and, and new knowledge production. Um, currently we're engaged with uh, two important projects with the University of Michigan. One is on the repatriation and rematriation of heirloom seeds that they have within their ethnobotanical collections. And we've been working on this project for the last two years, two and a half years, where we're sharing uh, seeds with the University of Michigan and, and indigenous ways of farming. And we're working to free some of the seeds from their collections and get them back to their origin community. Some of these seeds are 50 to 100 years old. And we'll see if they're still viable uh, by trying to grow some of them out at the Matai Botanical Gardens, which is a part of the University of Michigan system in a controlled environment. And we're, we're testing that controlled environment now by growing heirloom seeds that tribes are bringing to Matai to grow out and to share with the campus community. So this amazing project is happening right now. We're also, uh, we've also been engaged on a, a collaborative project to enhance the Museum of Natural History on campus with a uh, exhibition called We Dano Kindawag, We Work Together. And that is a co-curated exhibition on black ash uh, basketry, Great Lakes black ash basketry. So NAGPRA Comics, uh, the next edition uh, to follow up on, on this one is going to be about how NACPRA uh, can, can heal uh, relationships, how it can build new and respectful knowledge production, and how it can build uh, respect among institutions and Native peoples. You know, because many researchers and scientists think at the institutions that have NACPRA collections, they think, oh, all the Indians are just going to come in and clear the shelves and we're not going to have anything to study. Um, everything will be gone. But that's not the case when we work with mutual respect and we return uh, rightfully to the origin communities, their ancestors and belongings tribes are gonna work hand in hand with museums and institutions to celebrate and share our culture, to show the continuity from the time of our ancestors until what we're doing today. You know, we gifted a beautiful black ash basket to the University of Michigan uh, when we completed uh, Widano Kindawag. That basket was made by Josh Huminga from the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians, Bay Mills tribe and um, you know, so these things, relationships can can turn and can be, you know, a wonderful partnership. Uh, once you get, get beyond, you know, the power structures and when you get beyond, you know, the, the egos uh, that some of these folks have at these institutions that we can't let these things go, you know, and, and that's the ego. They think they can take care of our, our ancestors things better than we can. So I wanted to um, share that much and I see my friend, my new friends are back online and I know they have some questions and I'd like, we'd like to open this up to any of you who are on this afternoon to, to ask anything that you'd like. And I, I hope I can answer it, but if not, I can point you in a good direction. So thank you for this time and, and for listening to me uh, this afternoon. So we'll, we'll go to some questions. Great, thank you so much, Shannon. That was incredibly informative and interesting. And thank you also for sharing those images and that, that process. Um, 
we do have a few questions that have come into the Q&A box and um, I will acknowledge um, we may be running a little bit over time here, but um, it sounds like Shannon is um, game to stick around for a little bit. And yeah. so we, we hope some of the audience will as well. And if not, um, we also will have the recording of this available um, that you could refer to later if you wanted to check back to see if your question gets answered and you're not able to uh, stick around right now. Um, so we have um, one question here that is asking, and, and it sounds like you already have acknowledged a little bit some of the limitations of NAGPRA, um, but the question is, have you attempted any civil lawsuits against museums when you are meeting with um, resistance um, and, and institutions are refusing to cooperate in repatriation efforts? You know, we, we considered that when uh, we were uh, deliberating with the University of Michigan case early on uh, because we were being met with such resistance in the consultation period that we're, we, we, we saw the handwriting on the wall at that point. So, you know, we were thinking, how can we get through to them, you know, possibly through legal means? Uh, the NACPRA law, again, it, like I said, it doesn't have much teeth. As as penalizing anybody for being non-compliant. So we did think about a civil lawsuit against the University of Michigan and, and having all the tribes sign on. But again, you know, that that is lengthy and it's costly. University of Michigan has deep pockets. Um, so that was something that we had to, you know, weigh out. But it was it was one of those options. Um, but we're we're glad we took the path we did to believe. In, in ourselves and believe in our ancestors and to believe in, in, in the spirit of humanity uh, in reaching out to the regents and, and hoping that we would at least reach one or two of them to, to help make a change. Thank you. Uh, this next question comes from Emmy um, who writes, uh, Meg Wish, I learned a lot. Do you know any groups trying to repatriate ancestors from the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology? Yeah, I, I do believe, you know, there are some East Coast tribes that, you know, they have been trying for years and, and have been denied. Uh, I am thinking that um, it's the, uh, maybe the Wampanoags, uh, one of the, the tribes and possibly um, the Nipmucks. Um, so there are some East Coast tribes that have been diligently working for years trying to repatriate ancestors. Um, the Nipmucks are going to have a hard road to hoe because they're not federally recognized. You know, weren't they recognized for one day, um, which is so sad. Uh, but, um, you know, they, they can work with and build an alliance with other federally recognized tribes to assist in those efforts, but it, it really is, it's difficult. And some tribes do not have the capacity to even uh, manage a NAC for repatriation or, or a consultation grant. Um, they're hard to get, they're competitive. They only give out maybe eight a year. Um, and then with using your own tribal resources to travel to, you know, some of these institutions is often sometimes the burden of the tribe if you don't have a grant. So yeah, there are many tribes that are knocking on the door at Harvard's Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology um, and have been for years. Catherine, were there any other? We do. We have one more question that just came into the Q&A box. Um, and then also I see something's just come into the chat box as well. So I'm going to start with the Q&A box. Um, this is uh, from Carol, who says, I worked in the Department of Anthropology at the Smithsonian in the 1970s. I am saddened to report that the long corridor to my office was lined with shelves over six feet high, filled with skulls of Native Americans. It was an enormous collection. What might be happening now with, with th these remains held at the Smithsonian? Well, I hope that um, 
what you see, what you saw during your time there, uh, really, I hope that the Smithsonian has addressed, you know, the conditions in which they were, you know, displayed while you were there, Carol, but at this point, we just hope that they've been properly uh, inventoried and they, they're in proper museum quality um, boxes and that we, you know, they know who they belong to, a possible tribe, and that we hope they're initiating consultation with these tribes. Again, the Smithsonian affiliates, they, they fall under their own NACPRA law and it's because they're a federal government institution. So um, their law actually predates the 1990 law. It's, it's, their law was passed in 1989. Um, but at this point, you know, tribes are now beginning to fully engage with the Smithsonian uh, to effectuate the return of ancestral remains and, and funerary belongings from, from that institution. Uh, that's where we're turning to soon. The, the Michigan tribes are going to be turning towards um, the Smithsonian now to um, uh, begin consultation, not only on our ancestors, but items of cultural patrimony and sacred and ceremonial objects and get those back uh, to our origin communities here in Michigan. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I hope that that's not the case, that there just that aren't open skulls in the hallways anymore. I hope they took care of them and put them at least in, um, you know, museum quality boxes and with, with um, you know, with, with proper, you know, proper um, cushioning in there to, to cradle them in these boxes. Mm -hmm. I can tell you, um, when you think about the NACPRA law and those are proponents for it and those who are opposed to it, those opposed to it are always screaming from the rooftops about we're going to lose so much information. You know, science is going to go out the door. But when we've repatriated ancestral remains from some of these, you know, institutions and colleges and universities across the country, I have to tell you that our ancestral remains were in the same containers that they were donated in or that they were collected in. They were not removed or placed in any type of a museum acid-free boxing or uh, they weren't um, properly housed. So you had skulls, you know, ancestral skulls uh, banging around inside a box without proper cushioning. Uh, one place we brought ancestral remains home from, uh, and it was a smaller university, a smaller college. It wasn't a research one university, but the, their, their, um, our ancestors that were donated to them, uh, they were still in uh, old um, oatmeal tins, just placed in that. And then there were some um, infant remains that were in a matchbook their bones were in a matchbook, one of those sliding matchbooks. So when you think about, you know, scientists talking about we're going to lose, they haven't even looked at what they have and cared for what they have. So that's why, you know, it's important for us and, and places that are hoarding our ancestors, you know, these top 13 that are reluctant to consult and engage in repatriation, um, you know, it's, 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 it's tragic and it's sad uh, that they're still there and they haven't probably been used for any scientific research. They're just sitting on shelves in boxes and sometimes in the same bags and, you know, food, food containers that they were collected in, you know, 100 years ago. Yeah. Uh, Final question from the audience, and uh, this is from Carolyn, who writes, Shannon, let me first say how grieved I am to hear of the disrespectful treatment of ancestral remains. Your work is inspiring. My question is this, I have been tasked with making an inventory of art objects at my small Boston area college where I work. While I have not seen any ancestral remains, I am wondering how best to repatriate any objects I may find. I should add that there is very little accession documentation for the college's small, small art collection. 
uh, thank you for your time. Yeah, the best, um, the best way to uh, make determinations on something you may find uh, that's, that's questionable uh, and, and uh, questionable, I mean, it could be a, a, a burial object, a burial belonging, uh, or it could be a sacred object or ceremonial object, something of that nature. Um, here's some people call them antiquities, um, but uh, the best way to, to make determinations is to possibly call on some of your area, area uh, mm -hmm. folks uh, who work in this field. Uh, in the Boston area, you know, I can think of you know, some of the Wapanoags and, and uh, some of the other um, tribes in the Boston and Cape Cod area. Um, Jonathan Perry, uh, I think he's on tribal council for one of the tribes, the Aquina, he's with the Aquina. Um, he, he does re NAGPRA work and he's familiar with NAGPRA work. So maybe reach out to the area tribes, uh, tribal historic preservation officers for some of your area tribes to come in and um, if they have time to take a look at some of the things that you might think could be NACPR eligible and they may be able to um, help you make some determinations. And once that happens, if, um, if your institution would like to repatriate, then you have to submit uh, that um, summary to the National NACPR program. And once that happens, then um, Tribes will look at your institution, see what you have. And if it's, you know, based on the description or metadata that you do have, uh, may reach out to you and say, you know, we're interested in consulting with you on this. Or if uh, your tribal consultants can help make a determination of a tribe or region, if there's no information, uh, they can help, help maybe determine a provenience and at that point, then you can reach out to the tribes of that territory and say, we have this, this uh, object in our collection and would you be interested in consulting on it? So, you know, the consultation process can work both ways. You know, tribes are now keeping a close eye on the national NAGPRA database. So we see things, um, anything that may be related to us, we will reach out to an institution, but um, it, it is your responsibility if you do have a NACPR eligible object uh, or, or a sacred and ceremonial uh, piece to get, that in it, to get that inventory. But it depends on if you receive federal funding as well. Are you private or do you receive federal funding? I guess, Carolyn, if you could. Okay. Uh, I think private. Okay, so if you don't receive federal funding, then you don't fall under the purview of NACPRO. Um, if you're private and you would like to repatriate back to, try to repatriate something back to a community of origin, you can do this kind of the same steps. Call, you know, local tribal consultants, see if they'll work with you, tribal start preservation officers, NAGPRA practitioners, and call them to take a look at what you have. And then if they can help distinguish anything for you, then you can reach out to the tribes of origin if you'd like to repatriate, and that can happen quickly. You don't have to uh, go on under the NACPRA law and, and put that on a database. And thank you for that. Because we had one international repatriation that took place that way, and it was from the Museum of Art in Vancouver uh, Elizabeth Berkey, a young graduate student for, who is um, working on her master's at uh, the University of British Columbia. Uh, she was from Michigan. So as she was, you know, interning at the Museum of Art in Vancouver, she was shoring up and, and doing some tidying up in their collections area. And she found a box that said uh, Native American human female remains. And she went to her curators and her director and says, why do we have human remains? We're an art museum. And they said, well, it came as a donation with another lot, another collection. So 
you know, they're just here. And because there's no international law for NACPRA, um, she said, well, can we try to find a tribe or tribes to, you know, re, you know, repatriate these, these, this ancestor? And they said, yeah, go, you could. So please move forward with that. So because she was from Michigan and on the, the file, it said Great Lakes, Michigan, she found MACPRA online, the Michigan Anishinaabe Culture Preservation Repatriation Alliance. She found us online and then she contacted Willie Johnson, the chairman. And from that first phone call from Elizabeth Berkey, it took three months for the ancestor to make her way back home with Elizabeth. It was a Native American female from the Alpena area of Michigan. Elizabeth flew her back home and uh, we were able to uh, recommit her into the earth here at Saginaw Chippewa, but that was three months. So those, those um, repatriations can happen in that, that very expeditious and respectful way, uh, even from um, internationally and, and from private institutions. So uh, Carolyn, good luck with that. If you need any help, um, feel free to um, contact um, William Johnson and you can find him on the uh, MACPRA website. And I think that's www.macpra.org. And try our best to, to help you through this. Uh, but again, you can count on your, your local tribal practitioners in your area, Boston and, and Cape Cod. And if I might add a little additional advice that's been told to me is make a budget for that so that each consultant can be paid for their time along the way. Um, that's something that had been shared with me as I was embarking on that kind of thing. Awesome. Making sure we don't just kind of send something and ask for quick advice, but knowing that all that time is worth, worth being paid. <laughs> um, so, I think it might be a good time to wrap things up. And I just wanna say how incredibly moving your presentation was, Shannon. And um, we're really so grateful to you. And we will be, we have recorded this. So we're hoping that we can share this further and this really important personal information. And um, Catherine, do you think we should wrap it or should I, can I ask one question that I was a little I bit curious? I'll leave that up to uh, Shannon if you don't mind taking another moment. We have a little more of your time than we had originally asked of. So, <laughs> um, I'll keep it kind of a quick little question. Um, you you've been pretty clear that a lot of these big, larger universities that are partly federally funded have not been have not kind of softened and been receptive. And I was curious about in in this moment in the U.S. when it's especially um, divided. I had two questions. One was, um, did John O'Shea ever come around? Um, and in the comic, it's made pretty clear and in your presentation that he was very resistant because it was impossible to scientifically confirm uh, mm -hmm. affiliation. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious if he ever came around. And then also just in general, have you found it, um, a receptivity, at least from some parties, um, that's a little bit different from in the past, or does it seem like it's still just as steep of a path? Well, it's, it's, yeah, uh, Mr. O'Shea, it's, it's quite ironic because now uh, we're almost on the same side. And when it comes to the line five Enbridge pipeline going under this, you know, in the Straits of Mackinac and then, then Enbridge wanting to tunnel uh, underneath the uh, bottomlands. Um, he's now, you know, doing a lot of underwater archaeology and he's done some work in Lake Huron. But now we're almost allies because the tribes in Michigan are working to. Um, to um, decommission and stop uh, not only the pipeline, but stop the, the, the development of a um, uh, 
underground tunnel under the bottomlands because it's going to affect cultural resources on the bottomlands that you know, a group of private tribal citizens rented, you know, equipment and went out there, they found some archaeological resources on the bottomlands. So now, you know, Dr. John O'Shea is writing the same opinions and support uh, to not disturb the Straits of Mackinac and is now an alliance with tribes in that same position. So you know, we're counting on his expertise as an underwater archaeologist to side with us on this, and he's he's doing so. Great. His um, former collections manager, um, Dr. Carlos Snapley, who was also one of the directors of the Museum of um, um, Anthropological Archaeology at the University of Michigan, is is now a wonderful friend um, to not only me but you know Willie Johnson and my mom Sydney and you know times where you know we wouldn't even look at each other or talk to one another during consultation and in years after that now we're wonderful friends and she it was actually you know her her um idea to get this basket exhibition off the ground and she worked tirelessly to do that work before she retired from the university of michigan and moved out to uh university of new mexico but um, she, she said, you know, let's not talk about this exhibition anymore. Let's just do it. So we did the exhibition. It was first exhibited here at the Zeebwing Center about a year ago. And now it has shifted and has moved over to the Museum of Natural History at the University of Michigan. So Dr. Carla Sinopoli, you know, who was, um, you know, John O'Shea's collections manager and then was a director of the museum there, we're great now we send each other notes and gifts and you know it's just yeah so things can change mm -hmm. can shift and they can change for the better and and that's you know part of that recommitment work we do when we bring the ancestors home part of that ceremony is about appeasement and it's about offering prayers and songs um to, to um, soothe the spirits of our ancestors who were, you know, unearthed and desecrated. But part of that prayer and part of those songs also uh, soothes and, and repairs uh, the spirits of those who mishandled them mm -hmm. and kept them. And then further to appease, you know, a relationship and partnership that we as human beings can move on and we can do better things together when we work together. So it's part of that beautiful ceremony. It's just not, you know, for the ancestors. It's for us as, as the living people and descendants that are, are trying to do this good work and that we can move forward and do it together respectfully and do it, um, with care and love and that better things can flourish when we work together. And especially, you know, indigenous people uh, that have been prodded and poked and studied and uh, it's just better to talk with us, get our consultation, and then let's move forward to some, some good, fun, and important work together. It's such a wonderful note to conclude upon. And hopefully we'll be able to collaborate sometime in the future as well. I would love that. That would be amazing. So we'll stay in touch. That sounds okay. like a good deal. Well, thank you so much, um, Shannon. This has been wonderful. Um, and I just hope you have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. And I love that we did this on the 30th anniversary. Yes, we did. The law, yeah. so. Thank you so much. A little Anna. bit faithful. <laughs> yes, it's an it's amazing thing. So thank you much for having me. I enjoyed my time with you. And uh, in our language, we don't have a goodbye. We say, Bama P. Gawapman means I'll see you, I'll see you sometime down the path. Okay. Well, that sounds like a great deal. Thank you much, everyone, for joining us. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, everyone. everyone. Tuning in. Thank you. Bye, <laughs> Pink